right? It feels like it has been a long time, which it pretty much has been a three weeks before I've been able to be up here. And for that, um, walking in today and in the moments before everyone came in, just within me there is this, this again, this stirring of, of my heart for here. And it's weird to be home when I was home at grad and to sit through the graduation ceremony and um, our valedictorian, he spoke out of Mark 4 and he spoke how we're just farmers, his pastors, and how our job is not to make the growth happen, but rather to do our part, but we have to trust that God will do the rest. And then sitting um, under Pastor Sam and then on Huntsman last week, just more and more um, a growth was happening in terms of my heart for the summer here and for what is it that God is really wanting of us? And what is it that God wants first of myself individually, but then also of us as a collective group? And then what does that look like in the living out of our lives? Anne Consenin kind of started the, the stirring as she said that we, in this world and at our age as young adults, we're desperately seeking for intimacy, that that is the developmental task that we have in this part of our life. And we have this desperation within ourselves that we search to find that place of intimacy. And we try to find it with, in relationships, we try to find it with people in different communities and a significant other. If you look at anything that, that we're reading or in the magazines or stuff, this whole idea of relationship has been something that is sent to us, that message is continuously being spoken about on all different platforms. Um, BuzzFeed is one thing, but then we have the classy BuzzFeed Elite Daily on Facebook. And all of the articles, which I'm sure there's absolutely no research done for the majority of these, and often it seems like the author is trying to justify some form of action because girls who swear are the most attractive or whatever, and they come up with all of these things that have no basis really behind them, and yet we eat it up and we are constantly looking at this. In Korean culture and in general, what we like to do and what social media has done for us is it presents us with opportunities to lay out the highlight of our life. So the reason why the other day on the Q13, literally from downtown Flushing to Bayside, a girl took the same picture of herself multiple times. And the degree that she took was just a little bit different each time. It started really low, trying to be conspicuous, but by the end of it, it was way up high, and she's just trying to take the selfie, literally 20 minutes, just taking pictures of herself again and again, trying to find that perfect one. And then let's talk about filters. Then you start filtering away, and then you got your blemish remover or whatever, and we, we can then post this beautiful picture, and then we got all these likes, and we feel really great. And the competition of who has the most likes, or if after a few minutes you don't have enough likes, then you quickly delete it and then change it and whatever. Our social media would reveal our perfect highlights. We don't necessarily post what we look like first thing in the morning without cleaning up first, and we don't post the horrible meal that we burnt or whatever. We post the good parts. In our seek for intimacy, oftentimes what we do is we just do that. We present ourselves in the best possible way. Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, all of these things they reveal the good meals, our significant others, things we love, and then when summer finally comes. But the problem that this comes with is it sets this unrealistic expectation for us. Following multiple people on Instagram who are um, people who work out, it kind of like there's that moment in me where I'm like, ah, shoot, like I'm not there yet. Or the perfect outfit or whatever, and Pinterest is... If only I could just pin it and it ends up in my closet instead of just being something that I want or whatever. But we have this ability to see everything that we want and what seems to be impossible to obtain. And we've built up a wall of perfection that is just this facade that behind it it's empty and it is ready to break. In our desperate desire of intimacy, there also comes then this great fear of rejection. A fear of rejection that then leads to us to continue to put up a wall of perfection, to present ourselves the best way possible. Because if somebody actually knew the mess in our lives, they would reject it and they would walk away. 
Things that happen in Canada are snow in May. This was May 6th, it was Wednesday. I was driving from Edmonton, where I just stayed at my sister's house, and I was driving back down to Calgary. It's a three-hour drive. I woke up that morning, was ready to go for a 7 o'clock breakfast with somebody, which knows, if you know me at all, that is a pure act of love for me to make, wake up that early. I put on my hoodie, whatever, and I've like packed up all my stuff, and I walk outside, and there's six inches of snow right there. I'm in my toms and a hoodie, and I'm not at all prepared for winter, and my mom's snowbrush is like a New York snowbrush. Like, it's like this big, and it doesn't clear off snow that well. And I'm trapezing through snowdrifts trying to brush off the car. I can remember thinking to myself, this would happen when I'm home. It doesn't happen when I'm gone. It happens when I come home. It looks really pretty. And all this stuff, and I, and I Snapchatted this to multiple people, and I sent it to Angela, and was like, look at it, it's snow. However, this is not the only picture of snow that I have from that day. See, this is the other picture that I have of that day. It's me and a wonderful bitch. Because snow at that time of year means that already summer tires are on your car. And when you're on a back road that technically isn't full two lanes and there's other cars that are coming and you're going really slow, if you hit that one edge of the gravel, that one edge when it meets the grass, you're done. And that's it. So I ended up in the ditch. Here's the thing in Canada. People are nice. And immediately multiple trucks stop and they ask, are you okay? And they ask me, why are you dressed like this? Why aren't you prepared for winter? And I said, I'm not even from here anymore. And they're just laughing at me because apparently now I'm just from New York. And then a huge semi-truck comes and the chains come and they hook onto the back and then I get pulled out and then I get a flat tire while they're pulling me out. So what happened was that this 20 minute drive to say goodbye to my sister and return the house key turns into me fueling up the car, getting stuck in an hour of traffic because of white oak conditions, it ends up with me in the ditch and then me with a flat tire. Needless to say, it took me three hours to get out of the city. And as soon as I was maybe a mile outside of the city limit, there was no snow. I hate Canada. There are these moments where I hate Canada. And here's the thing, is that the whole time I was like, this is my life, this is what happens to me. It's never just the pretty snow. It's never just that, oh, it's a nice picture or anything like this. Rather, this is what happens. This is the reality of my life. Missed buses, ditches, ripped clothing, whatever. But this is often the part of our lives that we don't show anyone. See, in our desperate desire for intimacy and to be accepted and our fear of rejection, what happens with us is that as we put up this facade that we can't live up to, we are constantly worried that we'll be found out. Constantly worried that somebody will see a part of ourselves or will tell the actual thing that's going in our heart and it will be too messy and people will just walk away. Tim Keller says this, that people are messy. Relationships are messy, so expect messiness. But oftentimes what we expect is the perfect Instagram picture life. It's what brings peer pressure and makes us do dumb things that we wouldn't do by ourselves. This desire to be loved and accepted makes us terrified. That if somebody was to see the scars that mark our past and our heart, they would walk away. But what does this tension have to do with anything? Let's go to 1 John 4. It says this. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent his only son into the world. So that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God. But that he loved us and sent his son to be the preparation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God 
is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Once more, verse 14 through 19. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. So how do these two things come together? And this is where it is. Is that what God has offered us is perfect intimacy. That in the midst of him knowing the scars, of him knowing the sins, of him knowing the mess, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That this was his love for us. That even though we are messed up, that we are broken, that we are going to screw it up, his time goes on again and again and again. God loved us. And he picked us. And he picked us not when we had it all together, but he picked us when we were still far away from him, when we wanted nothing to do with him. While we were still positioned as enemies of God, Christ died for us. And he didn't die for some future version of ourselves. He doesn't love some future perfected version of ourselves, but he loves us as we are. See, the reason why his love is so perfect is because he's taken the punishment. When we go before him with our failures, when we go before him with our brokenness and our sin, we don't have to fear him. Are there consequences for our sin? Absolutely. But it's not punishment. That's not what the cross echoes to us. But at times as we reflect to one another this idea of a perfect life or a highlight reel or we only show what's good, we only testify of a fraction of what God has done in our lives because we don't want to admit our brokenness, it's as if we are trying to earn our way up to God's grace. Trying to make people have to love us. That they have a reason to because we have it all together, but that's not the gospel. And the problem is that as we allow culture to dictate to us what a perfect life looks like, instead of us being people who are dependent upon a Savior who died for us and who makes us perfect, as we try to earn it or as we try to do enough good things or as we try to pretend that we don't really need a Savior as badly as we do, we cheapen the gospel, but we also put this unrealistic expectation on ourselves, but also the community that we're within. That you are only accepted when you have come to such a level or to such a position of perfection and then we will receive you. And our fear of rejection from one another stems from a lack of confidence that would have come from an intimacy with God. Because here's the thing, oftentimes what we're looking into community to do is to tell us that we are unconditionally loved. And we look for humans to fill this void in us and to, t- to esteem us and to call us a certain level of goodness or whatever. As we look for their acceptance, we're looking for them to tell us unconditionally that they're right there for us. But here's the problem. No human can do that. The thing why rejection hurts us so much is that oftentimes we've raised that voice up in our lives to be higher than that of God's. And so we can't walk in real intimacy with one another because we're constantly waiting for the other to walk away or we're waiting for the other to tell us and to come into what, into our lives and to make everything better. To be our healer when God himself has called us to go to him. The reality is that there is perfect love that is afforded to us through the cross. 
We have a God who loves us so much. And he doesn't love some highlight reel that we present of ourselves, but he loves us completely in our brokenness. And in our brokenness, the cross echoes that he is enough. And that he can heal and that he can redeem. The cross tells us that we are accepted, that we are loved, that we are worthy objects of affection. Timothy Keller, in The Reason for God, says this, The Christian gospel is that I am so flawed that Jesus had to die for me. Yet I am so loved and valued that Jesus was, was glad to die for me. And this leads to a deep humility and a deep confidence at the same time. It undermines both swaggering and shivering. I cannot feel superior to anyone, and yet I have nothing to prove to anyone. I do not think more of myself nor less of myself. Instead, I think of myself less. All through undergrad and up until I moved to New York, I would waitress in a couple different restaurants. But the one thing that always frustrated me as a waitress and when I was bartending and whatever was this, was that if the kitchen made a mistake, my tip went down. But the kitchen's tip was always the same. And the thing with the tipping system is this. It's based on power. It's that the guest has this power over your livelihood because you're making less than minimum wage. Because you're supposed to be able to get these tips. And the reality is that when they penalize you, they're punishing you. And they're saying, you know, this wasn't good enough or whatever, so I'm going to lower your tip. Even if it's not your fault. Even if it's kitchen. But their tip out is the same. But I was always frustrated with this aspect. It was so annoying when somebody else would make the mistake and you get penalized for it. And within, there's this, because you're dealing with your livelihood and trying to pay rent and everything like this, there's that aspect where you want to get angry and you want to lip off to the kitchen or whatever, or you want to plead your cause with these guests who are in this position of power. And when they're able to work in a system where there's punishment, where there's condemnation, Immediately, there's always constantly this fear of, am I measuring up to their standard? And it's in an insecurity that can come up in community that keeps us from being able to have intimacy because we're always wondering, is this where they walk away? Is this where it's too much and they give up? Is this where they finally say it's too much? But when we have the confidence that comes from God, from relationship with God, there's an aspect of us that comes with a deep confidence that I am more loved and more accepted than anyone possible. That the one who knows me intimately, my flaws, my brokenness, my sin, all of that stuff, that on the cross they echo and reveal how much he loves me. See, here's the thing. Joan, if you want to come up. It's this is that we have to understand the gospel. We have to understand this gospel of the cross. We have to understand this, is that we are more loved and accepted than we could ever ask or imagine. And we're not accepted based on our Instagram pages or the likes that we get, but we are accepted because God has called us to be his children. And by the blood of Jesus Christ, we're able to say and plead the blood of Jesus, and we're completely accepted and adopted by God. Yes, we are so flawed and so broken, but we are also so valued and so loved. We have this ability to not be afraid. There's a confidence that can come that we can walk forward in. That says, yes, we desire intimacy and community. But if I'm rejected in that community, or if something happens and somebody walks away, then the tension that's going to come, it's not going to be as devastating as other times it would have been. Oftentimes, our greatest fear of rejection is not a basis or it's not built on a foundation of the gospel. It's often based
case note of the fact that we don't have intimacy with the Father. See, if we could just understand, imagine if we could just understand what it is to be completely loved and cherished by God. To not have to pretend that we're perfect, that's not the thing here. Because the cross says that we messed up and that we are so far gone from the glory of God. The cross tells us exactly who we are. Sinners and adopted as children of God. Both of them are who we are. We don't deny one to make up for the other. We are both. We are renewed. We are transformed by the gospel. We are transformed when we call on the Lord. And his love is perfect. We don't have to fear punishment. Where with other people, when we share the mess of our lives, there's always that fear. Is this where they're going to walk away? That's not what it is with God. God isn't just looking to then say, oh, you've sinned too much. Oh, grace has run out on you. No, there's more and more grace and love. And that is where we find a confidence. That is where we find our value. It's not found in how many likes on Instagram. It's not found in whether or not we're dating somebody or how many people like are checking us out or whatever or what our paycheck at work is. That's not where our value is. If that is where our value is placed, we will walk in a charade of perfection. We will walk with this wall built up that is so fragile and will shatter in a moment. But if we find ourselves rooted in Christ, if we find ourselves grounded Receiving the love of God, understanding that confidence that comes no matter what happens, no matter who rejects this here, no matter how bad it gets, there is an ability that we have to walk forward into the world with dignity. This isn't something that's easy. This has been probably the lesson of the past spring semester, I would say. Coming from somebody who, just due to my dad always being at work and things like this, has these deep abandonment issues, and God started to speak into them, and God didn't start simply by saying, oh, everything's going to be fine. It started with, Rachel, I'm right here in the midst of the darkness. I'm right here when you don't feel like I'm anywhere near to you, when you feel isolated, when you feel lost in this country that's not your own. I'm right here. And he began to speak dignity over me. He began to speak what I felt had been stripped away by different things and different experiences. And he restored it to me. He restored it to me in this way. He said, I have nothing to fear when I go before him. Because he's not out to punish me. He's out to heal me. His wounds can be trusted. His word is true. I can hold on to it when it doesn't make sense. That his affirmation is more than what anyone else could give or could take away. Because as Romans 8 says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. That is something that is so secure and yet we don't tap into it often enough. Now I wonder what transformation would happen within our community. Or what would happen within our church if we understood this. What would it look like in our lives? How would it change our relationships? Because here's the thing. Is that if we're looking for other people to affirm us and to build us up and to be the voice of God in our lives, is that we are constantly using other people. Now, yes, God has called us to lean on one another, to carry burdens together. But if we don't understand this confidence from God, then when we go into relationship with one another, we will use one another. And it will be from a broken motivation of a heart that's desperately seeking for something that no human can give us. We can't love one another as Christ loved us until we actually can recognize and receive the love that God has for us. You see, the love of God allows us to call sin, sin. It allows us to look into the very brokenness of our hearts and to go before him in confession. But it also allows us to go before him knowing that we are adopted as children, that he's not going anywhere. It's the very thing that gives us that confidence that this isn't how the story ends, no matter how messy the process is. 
See, God knew exactly what he was getting when he called us. He knew exactly how many times we would try to do it on our own, how many times we would walk away. He knew the depth of our sin, and he saw it all, and he still loved us. And we can continue to live a life of trying to pursue this intimacy with other things or with other people, and we can get angry at the community that we feel as if they owe us something because they're not feeding our love tank or whatever. But often, the problem isn't that the community around us isn't doing enough for us, although at times there is that brokenness. Oftentimes, more than anything else, it is the fact that we haven't allowed God to be God and to speak truth into our lives. We can attend church, we can hear all the things, but unless we actually allow God to start to move in our heart, we will be lost in the cycle of seeking acceptance from people who can't give us that unconditional love and that confidence that allows us to go forward. The most powerful thing that we could ever encounter is the love of God. It's not something small. It's not something that we have turned into the children's song. And yes, Jesus loves me is a great melody. Yes, it is so full of power. And yet at times we dumb it down and we try to make it be this little gift. But there is so much more to it. Father God, we come before you. Bowing not only our heads, but God, also our hearts. We are not in this moment able to go before you and to say that we have it all together, or that we deserve your love or anything like that, God, because that's not, that's not what the cross tells us. But God, when we come before you, there is such a powerful truth that yes, we are completely flawed, but we are valued and loved at the same time. And so, God, in our own lives, I ask right now that you would begin to stir in our hearts those areas that we have, A, been just trying to hide our sin from you, that we have tried to excuse it, that we've tried to make these nice little boxes for that sin. But, God, I ask that you would, through your spirit, convict us, God, that you would reveal to us really what is going on. And, God, in the same, the same time, God, I ask that you allow us to receive your love and the truth of your cross. Knowing that you're not going to punish us, that the punishment is completely on the cross, that Jesus paid that debt. And for us, what you desire is intimacy. And God, I pray that you would begin to stir in us that confidence that comes, that no matter what happens in our in interactions and in our engagements with other people, God, that we can have that confidence that we are accepted and valued and loved exactly how we are, that there's no need to pretend. And God, out of that confidence, God, would we then walk in the same way with one another? That we would extend that same grace to one another, even though the outworking of that at times can be so hard. God, would you move and would you heal? So, Father God, in these quiet moments, would you speak?
our hearts would be soft to receive that truth, God. The reality of our brokenness, but also, God, the reality of your love and of your acceptance. would rise up in us, God, and that is what allows us to go through the trials. It is what allows us to not be devastated in broken relationships or anything like that. It's the one thing that allows us then to go into community and serve. And so, God, would you continue to do the work that you have started? God, as you promise that your word does not return void, God, but it accomplishes what you have set it out to do, I ask that you would do that. God, as we continue in response with offering, God, that even in this, God, that you would be working in our hearts. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.